Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben Barrows. I'm the Dean of the College of Law, and I'd like you to welcome you to this lecture marking the installation of Lee J. Strang as the John W. Stepler Professor of Law and Values. I'd like to especially welcome um, Lee's parents, Cliff and Jane, and his wife, Elizabeth, and his uh, eldest son, Justin. Um, the Stepler Professorship is one of four created by the generous donations of Eugene N. Balk and the Anderson family. The others are held by um, Joseph Slater, who holds the Eugene N. Balk Professorship of Law and Values, Jeffrey Rapp, who holds the Harold A. Anderson Professorship of Law and Values, and Rebecca Zitlow, who holds the Charles W. Fornoff Professorship of Law and Values. We're happy to host this event today as part of the week-long celebrations of the inauguration of Sharon Gaber as president of the University of Toledo. President Gaber couldn't make it to join us today because she's tied up in uh, University Board of Trustees meetings. Um, but it's especially fitting that we have this lecture as part of the inauguration celebration because Dean Stapler, in addition to his service as Dean of the College of Law, served as interim president of the University of Toledo in 1988. I'm personally very happy to be here to celebrate Lee's installation as the Stapler professor. Lee and I have known each other a long time. Uh, we met pretty early in our careers as, as academics. Um, Lee is a very distinguished scholar, uh, and he's uh, earned a national reputation for his work, especially in constitutional law. He's authored more than 20 law review articles and book chapters, and is the author of an innovative constitutional law casebook. Uh, early in his career, he dabbled in property law, and I've cited his work in my own scholarship. Lee earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Loris College. He earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Iowa, where he was an editor of the Iowa Law Review and a member of the Order of the Coif. He earned a Master's in Law from Harvard Law School. Lee clerked for the Honorable Alice M. Batchelter of the Uni United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and practiced law at Jenner and Block in Chicago. He's also served as a specialist in the United States Army Reserve. Before joining UT, he taught at Ave Maria Law School and the Michigan State University College of Law. And this semester, he's a visiting scholar at the Georgetown University Center for the Constitution. Today, Lee will be speaking about the role of the public university in our religiously pluralistic society. It's an especially appropriate topic, I think, for the installation of a lecture of one of the professorships that came out of the vision and generosity of Eugene Balk. Uh, earlier today, I was reading the correspondence of the original creation of these professorships in the, from the early 1980s, and it's clear that Mr. Bach's original vision is that he wanted the holders of these professorships to engage in big questions of public import, to consider values, and all the professorships are named Professorship of Law and Values. He closed his proposal for the professorship that he envisioned with a quote from Pope John Paul II remarking on the imposition of martial law in his native Poland. In part, this quote reads as follows, the conviction is gaining ground daily in public opinion that the peoples must be able to choose freely the social organization to which they aspire for their own country and that this organization should be in conformity with justice in respect of freedom, religious faith, and human rights in general. In the United States, religious freedom and religious pluralism are founding values of our nation. Living in accordance with those values, as we learn often in the College of Law, can lead to their complications and conflicts and disagreements. And I'm very glad that today Professor Strang will engage in these issues and share his thoughts with us. So without further ado, Professor Lee Strang. Thank you very much, Dean Barrows, for your generous introduction. And I was actually going to mention that we've known each other since we were young law professors, I think maybe a dozen or so years ago. And uh, at the time, we taught and wrote in the same area as property law. And I'm delighted uh, that he's our dean. Uh, I was so happy to see his name in the mix in the beginning and that ultimately he became our dean. Uh, I am wondering, however, if I've done something wrong since we entered the law uh, teaching business at the same time and he's already a dean and I'm still in the lowly ranks of law professors. 
Thank you, of course, to uh, former Dean Steinbach and my colleagues for entrusting me with the John W. Stepler Professorship of Law and Values and to Eugene Balk for endowing this professorship. Uh, ben mentioned that my parents, Clifford and Jane Strang, are here, so I wanted to extend a thank you to them for raising me, uh, giving me a loving upbringing, forming my character. Although, on reflection, I thought, was it really that hard to raise somebody in Iowa? I mean, what, what was there to do in Iowa other than to read books and look at corn all the time? <laughs> Most of all, thank you to my wife, the uh, lovely and talented Elizabeth, for making our life together so full, happy, and rich. The title of my installation lecture is Public Universities as Places of Constrained Debate, a home for people of goodwill, including religious people. I'm going to argue that, despite pressure to do otherwise, public universities, such as the University of Toledo, should include a significant percentage of religious faculty and students because of the value that they bring to the universities and to our broader society. I'll speak for approximately 25 minutes and then leave some time for questions and comments. This is a really rich subject, as Dean Barrows had mentioned. Uh, my limited time frame, I'm only to able to sketch out the outline of my argument. And so I'm looking forward to our discussion, which will allow me uh, potentially to flesh out my claims more, more deeply. Let me say a couple of words about the reasons why I chose this topic. I initially thought that I would talk about originalism. I'm sure my colleagues were like, oh, sure, Strang's going to talk about originalism. That's all he talks about. Um, but I sat down and reflected about all the different areas of scholarship that I've written. So a little bit of property law, some law and religion, the history of Catholic legal education. And as I reflected on what's motivated my scholarship, what explained it all, I recalled that I think it's best explained by a perspective that's relatively unique in the legal academy today, and that's a Thomistic natural law perspective, which had its genesis in my Roman Catholic religious belief. And I thought that this topic fit well with my chair's namesake, the Dean Stepler, and my predecessor, Susan Martin. And I didn't even know about the uh, comments by, by Mr. Balk as well. On the, on the other hand, at the end of the topic, you may be thinking to yourself, I wish this guy would have stuck with originalism, so we'll see how it goes. First, I'm going to describe the evolution of the university from a place where scholars and students together performed a, uh, pursued a theologically informed big T truth to today's universities, which are places of constrained debate. Second, I argue that public universities should include a robust number of religious faculty and students to fulfill the university's roles as places of constrained debate because religious people bring distinct value to that constrained debate and their inclusion is beneficial to our society. Third, I describe some of the increasing pressures on universities to marginalize and exclude religious people, and I argue that universities should resist those pressures. So universities evolved from their initial vision of participants together pursuing theologically informed truth to modern universities as places of constrained debate. Today's university has its origins in the high Middle Ages. It was a time of increasing economic prosperity and stability. And so this uh, era saw a need for increased numbers of people with skills that one could acquire through study. Uh, for example, the church, but also consolidated kingdoms, needed educated people to staff and govern those institutions. It was also a period of tremendous intellectual ferment. Beginning in the 12th century, the West recovered access to many ancient writings. In particular, a large body of Aristotle's writings was translated into Latin. Prior to this time, the primary theological and philosophical lens through which Western Europeans saw themselves and saw the world was Augustinian. So Aristotle's writings, both those that were sympathetic to and in tension with Christianity, caused tremendous intellectual excitement. The university was the location for a robust debate between different philosophical schools that resulted from this ferment. My own intellectual hero, St. Thomas Aquinas, who lived through most of the 13th century, was both a participant in these debates and the founder of one of the enduring schools, what we today call Thomism. The medieval university structure, both its physical structure and its curricular structure, reflected the broader culture's commitments. Europeans in the Middle Ages shared essentially the same answers to the most important questions of life. Is there a God? What is his relationship to me? What is my purpose? How should I treat others? In this culture, there was a generally recognized truth and a process to evaluate truth claims. An example is the then hot topic of whether private property ownership was sinful. St. Thomas Aquinas relied on the cultures of then existing authorities, scripture, church tradition, widely accepted philosophical claims, and argued that God had created private property both for individual human flourishing and for the societal common good. Theology was the architectonic discipline, the master science that organized these other disciplines. Theology was the key science because it provided the clearest and most reliable answers to these important questions. It had the overarching view of big T truth. It therefore was able to identify what role law, for example, should play in an individual human life and consequently in the university's curriculum. 
It was therefore able to identify the organizational structure for the university's curriculum, and it provided, in fact, the name, the unity that the name university represents. One representative and important part of the university's curriculum was something called the Disputatio. The Disputatio was the focal case of the university's intellectual life. In it, following a lecture by a master, the audience would dialectically test the lecturer's arguments. As described by philosopher Alistair McIntyre, it was because both the audience and lecturers accepted standards of truth and rationality, independent of either, that each could summon the other to test any particular thesis in the form of disputation, the intellectual equivalent of trial by ordeal. So while there was disagreement and debate during this period, it was not radical. It did not go to the premises and authorities employed by the participants in the debate, and instead was constructive as the participants built on a common foundation towards one truth. For good or ill, that is not today's public university. For a host of reasons, Western society fractured, and I'll just mention two. First, religious pluralism was first introduced in a major way in the West with the Reformation, and that pluralism deepened with time. Second, the rise of modern science, including, in particular, evolution, made it possible for one to be non-religious and to still have plausible explanations for many important phenomena in the world, such as human existence. Our situation today, therefore, is one of deep pluralism and for the foreseeable future. This means that our culture has no consensus on the truth, how to achieve it, or how to evaluate truth claims. Think, for example, of our society's interminable debates over abortion. Pro-life and pro-choice advocates talk past each other because both utilize standards of truth different from the other. In some, in our culture, there is no consensus like that which undergirded the medieval conception of the university. In this environment, the modern university has taken shape, both physically and curricularly. This university cannot organize itself around one particular discipline's claims to authoritative access to the truth because there is no generally recognized truth and no generally recognized means of accessing it or for evaluating it. For example, in the discipline of law, the deep pluralism of the broader culture has filtered in to make questions of what the law is and why we should follow it tremendously controversial. Instead, specific disciplines, utilizing their own standards of rationality, evaluate the work done in that and only that field. Indeed, even within the various fields of inquiry in universities, the respective disciplines' standards typically pre prescribe non-substantive criteria. For example, within law, our criteria for an excellent work of scholarship is not, at least not typically, whether the work reached the correct answer. Instead, we look to, for instance, whether the scholar is familiar with and engaged with the relevant literature, whether the scholar made the stock argumentative moves, and whether the scholarship is an adequately deep exploration of the subject. The modern university is no longer aimed towards answering the most important questions of human life. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? As Paul Gauguin's painting asks. No single discipline takes responsibilities for these most important of questions, and the modern university as a whole doesn't either. In sum, the modern university has retained the form, professors still profess what they teach, and scholars still write scholarship, attempting to persuade their peers without the substance, without an expectation that the process is moving towards the truth. And the university's substance has been replaced. Today's modern university, both within the various disciplines and among the disciplines, is a place of constrained debate. In it, the participants do not anticipate persuading the other of the truth of their claims, so there is no resolution to the discussion. The debate is also constrained because the participants, as ongoing participants in the debate, may not and do not take action that violates the integrity of the other participants. These debates are not the kill them all clashes like the wars of religion, the 20th century's ideological battles, or the uh, between communism, fascism, and freedom, or the religious cleansing occurring in the Middle East today. Instead, public universities are places of constrained debate. This debate is vigorous and heartfelt, but respectful of the participants' physical and non-physical integrity. There are two primary reasons I want to offer today why public universities, like the University of Toledo, as places of constrained debate, should welcome religious citizens of goodwill as faculty and students. First, religious citizens have significant and in many cases unique contributions to make to the constrained debates within universities. And let me focus on a couple of examples. First, John W. Stepler's contributions show the value of including religious people in public universities and the value that they bring to those universities. Dean Stepler, as Dean Burroughs had mentioned, served the university in many, many capacities, including faculty member, 
an associate dean, dean, interim university president, and interim vice president. He also served his church in the broader community, especially upon retirement for many years. Dean Stepler's life and, 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 and work was a manifestation of his religious beliefs. By all account, Dean Stepler treated his colleagues and coworkers at the university with the same respect that he wished to receive. In doing so, he helped create the background conditions which in, within which constrained debate was possible, and he devoted significant service hours utilizing his legal talents to advance his church's mission. My predecessor and colleague, Susan Martin's life and scholarship, reflects the unique contributions that religious faculty can bring to universities. Professor Martin's area of teaching and scholarship, not by happenstance, is legal ethics, and her many and signal contributions to the area are manifestations of her religious identity. For example, just this year, she published a book chapter entitled, How, I'm sorry, Can Luther Help Modern Lawyers Understand Fiduciary Duty? And this is just one of many, many pieces where Professor Martin enlisted her religious perspective to enrich her scholarship. As recently summarized by Dean Marie Fallinger in the University of Toledo Law Review's tribute issue to Professor Martin, Dean Fallinger stated, Professor Martin's Lutheran commitments have undergirded her scholarly writings. My own scholarship also reflects the relatively unique religious perspective that I bring to the university. And here's a little bit of originalism for you. My main area of scholarship is constitutional interpretation, and in particular, originalist constitutional interpretation. Originalism is the theory of interpretation focused on the Constitution's public meaning when it was ratified. A kind of crude way of thinking about originalism is, as an example, what did Americans in 1791 understand the word religion to mean when it was ratified in the First Amendment? For the past dozen years, I've been working toward a theory of interpretation that takes as a starting point the natural law theory associated with St. Thomas Aquinas. This perspective on law, though relatively rare in the American Legal Academy today, is a venerable 2,300-year-old tradition of thought and engagement. And in a book on originalism that I'm completing this fall, I argue that originalism is the correct theory of interpretation because it creates the background conditions against which Americans today can best pursue their own individual flourishing, their own happiness. I also argue that interpretation needs judges with the judicial virtues, so think, for example, of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, to effectively perform their jobs. And these concepts, human flourishing and virtue, have their home in the Thomistic natural law tradition, but have received relatively little voice in the legal academy. Let me give you one concrete example of how, I think anyway, the Thomistic natural law tradition has facilitated my originalist scholarship, and that's the subject of non-originalist precedent. One of the major challenges to originalism is the existence of non-originalist precedent. Non-originalist precedent is just precedent that incorrectly interpreted the Constitution. And there's a lot of non-originalist precedent out there, much of it deeply entrenched and highly respected. Just one example. After the Civil War, the Supreme Court held in a series of cases called the Legal Tender Cases that, con that Congress could constitutionally print paper money, despite the language of Article I, Section 8, Clause 5, which authorizes Congress to, to coin money. So I've argued elsewhere that originalism requires judges to give all precedent, including non-originalist precedent, significant respect, because that is the original meaning of Article III's judicial power, which federal judges uh, utilize. And I then argued that this conception of precedent is normatively attractive because it enables an originalism to avoid overruling deeply entrenched and respected non-originalist precedents like the legal tender cases. And doing so advances the common good and ultimately human flourishing. I then showed how judges giving non-originalist precedent the significant respect demanded by the Constitution must possess the judicial virtues to do so effectively. Because whether to overrule the non-originalist precedent or if not how to limit it uh, requires that the judge uh, utilize um, uh, the ju judicial virtues to do so because of the challenges to that judgment. Now, of course, these concepts, such as human flourishing and judicial virtue, are claims that can be brought by anybody, including, of course, non-religious people. But typically, they are not. I think there's a host of reasons for that. Let me offer just one. Demographically, most non-religious Americans are not familiar with or are skeptical of concepts like human flourishing and virtue because they make robust claims about human nature. I think there's a lot of other explanations, but one's enough for now. Universities, second, universities are our society's primary location for constrained debate. To be effective in their unique and important role as places for constrained de debate, universities must welcome citizens of goodwill, including religious people. Universities are places of constrained debate, and those places are nearly unique in our society today. There are very few places, physical or otherwise, 
where Americans can come together and, and debate in a robust but respectful manner. We have very few substantive debates between two or more people today. People are busy watching TV or have too short of attention spans caused by constant electronic stimulation. Civic organizations in which such debates might have taken place in the, in the past, such as the Lyceum movement, have atrophied and most have died. The media is generally not such a place for debates because of the nature of such media, like television, or changes in the marketplace that have modified media to exclude constraint debate, such as newspapers. And I'm thinking, how many people, for those people who watch the, the different uh, primary debates by the Republican candidates, so you had 12 or so people each given a couple of minutes, it was, it was sound bites, right? And the claim I'm making here is that the nature of television pushes us towards that kind of non-debate debate. And yet, America needs a place for constrained debate if our society is to have any sort of moderately functioning civil and social life. We no longer have multiple day-long debates like the Lincoln and Douglas debates. We therefore need public universities to take their place. The majority of Americans are religious, and a significant minority of our fellow citizens are robustly so. Since religious people make up a significant chunk of our society, they should participate in these intra-university debates that occur about and for our society. Relatedly, religious beliefs are some of the most valent on the important subjects of debate within our society. Whether or not a person is religious and what form the religious identity takes has a major impact on that person's beliefs uh, more generally. For instance, regular church attendance is significantly correlated with particular views on a host of important issues. Public universities need to include religious people in their debates because their views are relevant to society's debates. From civil rights and marriage to gun control, the environment and national defense, religious traditions have valuable insights to provide and motivate American public policy. And of course, I think the classic example is the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s where religious people and religious ideas played a prominent role. Or think, for example, of law schools. Law schools are where current lawyers engage in scholarship on pertinent legal issues and train future leaders. If a law school includes mostly or only non-religious people on their faculty or in their student body, they will not include the broader society's perspectives on the legal system which, which it governs and serves. And more importantly, religious perspectives have major impact on individual and societal debates on legal issues, including the most hotly contested debates of our day. Significant increasing pressure is being brought to bear in our culture generally and on public universities to exclude and marginalize religious citizens of goodwill. Strong cultural, political, and legal forces are working to limit religious Americans' access to the real and figurative public square. So think about culturally. American people are no longer as uniformly religious as we once were. Recent evidence suggests that approximately 20% of Americans no longer identify as religious, and some percentage of the remaining 80% are likely nominally religious. This demographic sea change has profound implications. And in the culture, this means that religious claims and religious perspectives are no longer natural, they no longer are assumed to be legitimate participants in the public square, and religious liberty claims are therefore perceived to have less value than other interests. Or think about politically. Claims of religious liberty have frankly lost traction and have become the target of political sloganeering. For example, Indiana's recent proposed Religious Freedom Restoration Act created a firestorm of opposition, one unimaginable in 1993 when the nearly unanimous Congress passed and President Clinton signed the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act or legally. State and federal law and lawsuits have been used to limit religiously motivated action. Of course, there's the HHS mandate, which was a federal regulation emanating from the Department of Health and Human Services, which is ostensibly implementing the statutory command of the Affordable Care Act to impose a list of preventative care services on employers, including contraception and abortion-inducing drugs, against which non- and for-profit religious employers have raised religious liberty claims. In many states, religious-owned businesses, including photographers, bakers, bed and breakfasts, dentists, schools, restaurants, and others, have been sued and threatened with suit. Or think, for instance, something a little bit closer to home, about judges. Does our society any longer have room for Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the role of judges and other officials who, for example, solemnize marriages? Or do we tell religious Americans, like Judge McConnell here in Toledo, that he can't be a judge any longer because we cannot make room for his religious beliefs? Marginalization and exclusion of religious Americans in public universities is also occurring. Across the nation, religious faculty and students are on the receiving end of marginalization and exclusion. Religious student groups and faculty have received different and mistreatment because of their religious beliefs. Just one example. 
An associate professor of criminology at UNC last year won a federal lawsuit for being denied promotion based on his religious views, which for those of you who know how tenure promotion works in, in the system, that the, coming up with the kind of evidence from the plaintiff's perspective for that shows that there was a robust amount of, 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 um, of, uh, of, of motivation going on there. Um, and the, the other case I'm thinking about is the Professor Teresa Wagner, who did not receive a faculty appointment at the University of Iowa. The appellate court recently reversed the district court's ruling, and now she's getting a trial again on that, on that issue, even though the evidence is hard to come by. Unfortunately, it must be admitted that even at UT, religious perspectives and people have received marginalization and exclusion. Consistent with the actions of other universities across the nation, UT has attempted to exclude religious individuals and student groups from expressing their religious perspectives. University Vice President Crystal Dixon in 2008 was fired after publishing an op-ed stating her religiously inspired views on human sexuality. Or in 2005, the university excluded the Christian Legal Society because of its statement of faith that restricted officers to members of that faith of Christianity. These and other overt instances of marginalization and exclusion do not convey the covert marginalization and exclusion that goes on through hiring practices and social conventions within universities. My claim here is not that you should agree in the abstract or even in these concrete situations that the religious claims and arguments should have succeeded. My more narrow claim is that religious persons and ideas are under pressure in the public square and universities in a way that they haven't been in the past. And one way to test this claim is to ask yourself, go back to 1993 when RIFRA was passed, would the University of Toledo have excluded a religious group because its students limited their officers to members of their own religion? And if you answer no, then I think that shows that there is increased pressure to marginalize or exclude religious students. And of course, to be clear, I'm not being an alarmist. This isn't other countries like Nazi Germany excluding entire facets of religious faculty. But my claim is that the pressure is real and that it's growing. So up to this point, what I've argued is that the key differences for today's universities is that they are unable to organize and pursue the big T truth on the most important issues because of our culture's broad and deep pluralism. Therefore, public universities, my argument goes, have no basis to exclude religious people so long as those people participate in the constrained debate. Second, I've also argued that public universities and our society's, society benefits from religious people's participation in universities' constrained debate, and therefore public universities should include religious people. Lastly, let me add that university exclusion of religious people and ideas I think would also have a negative feedback loop of pushing religious Americans to withdraw from the broader society and recreate or create their own subculture, their own institutions, including institutions of higher education. And that this would drive religious Americans or could drive religious Americans out of mainstream society, depriving our society of their valuable insights and actions and threatening religious balkanization within our society. And I think there actually is some evidence of this already occurring. So think about different examples where Americans are making significantly different decisions that functionally, if not physically, wall them off from other Americans based on their religious beliefs. So homeschooling, for example, is a phenomenon where, among other things, re is a rejection of public education or a one-size-fits-all education where all Americans come together. And homeschooling is predominantly a religious phenomenon, and so it's become a fun functionally a religious subculture. Another example is politics. Americans of different religious views statistically participate in different political activities based on their religious views, creating different subcultures. So in my remarks today, I first describe public universities as places of constrained debate. Second, I argue that public universities should include religious Americans as equal participants in that debate. And I tied this claim to John Steffler, Susan Martins, and my own contributions, I hope, to the University of Toledo. Third, I showed that public universities are under pressure to exclude religious Americans from their forum for debate and why this would be a mistake, because it would exclude a valuable and representative perspective from public universities, including the University of Toledo. Thank you very much. Constructive criticisms or unconstructive? Yes? Um, in my experience, 30 years as a professor, and before that, eight years as a student, um, there were, I think part of why universities resist some of this is the fear of offending somebody. And by offense, and I assure you, in 38 years of being around academics, I've been offended many times <laughs> by things colleagues have said to me as a woman, okay? Um, 
or as a person of faith or anything. I mean, there have been a number of cases of offense. Um, but the reality is, is that I think universities are very scared of being sued. Um, by someone who says this is a hostile work environment, this is a hostile university environment. Um, and so to make sure we offend no one, we say nothing controversial about anything, religious or otherwise. Um, and again, it's not just Christians. I think it's the Palestinian student organization wants to come to campus and a Jewish group is offended, or vice versa. Um, so they just don't have anything. And I think that, so I, I guess I'm just wondering if it's more about the offense, the perceived offense to, to the per people who are on campus. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so I guess one thing would be, accepting my descriptive claim, which I haven't fully fleshed out, but I'll spend a little bit of time on that, which is that universities, um, I don't have any data on UT in particular, I just have personal experience, um, are uh, underrepresent religious people What's the causal explanation for that, right? So you're, what you're saying is that the causal explanation for that is people who make hiring decisions, people who, uh, who uh, uh, like faculty members who hire other people are afraid. If we hire a religious person X, that person's gonna either say to our colleagues or to their students kind of crazy religious stuff and, and offend the students, offend their colleagues. Okay, um, I, think that, uh, I think that that's a plausible explanation. Um, I think there's actually, in my personal experience, I've seen some evidence of that, um, not here at UT, but like in other, in other areas where I remember one interaction where in discussing the hiring of one faculty member for a law school, one of the questions raised was that that person had written scholarship on law and religion and, and uh, have their own religious perspective. And, and the question was, it's kind of close to what you were saying, Linda, but not quite, would students feel comfortable talking to that professor, knowing what that professor's written about, which I kind of always thought, that was a little bit of a hard claim to make. Like, how many students go out and read all of a faculty member's scholarship before, before teaching? But in other words, I think there is some evidence that supports that, that, supports that proposition. Um, that's, which I, so I think it's plausible. Um, I don't think that explains just religion, though, right? So uh, uh, re people get uh, offended for all kinds of issues. So uh, gender was one of the ones that you had mentioned. Um, and, uh, and, and so people get offended for all kinds of issues. That doesn't just explain religion, right? So assuming that religion is demographically, religious people are demographically underrepresented. Um, and it also doesn't explain, um, I, so it doesn't explain religion. And it also doesn't explain what I think is probably the more likely phenomenon, right? So, so when you look at statistical, statistical surveys about uh, universities more generally, or law schools in particular, what they show is that um, law schools and universities tend to be relatively homogeneous, right? They tend to be relatively homogeneous politically, ideologically, and then pertinent to this topic, religiously. And, and I think there can be two hypotheses consistent with that, and also consistent with what you're saying, that would account for how that demographic fact arises, right? Let me put off one thing that I don't think explains it, right? So one explanation might be, well, religious people just don't like to go into higher education as teachers, or don't have the capacity to go into higher education as teachers, right? So I don't see any evidence that religious people don't want to go into higher education as teachers. And the evidence that I have seen shows that there's a statistically significant correlation between educational achievement and religion. In other words, more education equals more religious identity. And so that would push against the claim that they don't have the capacity to get into it. So what are the other hypotheses, right? So one would be the kind of, um, uh, the, the more benign explanation I think would be that uh, Given the, given the demographic fact that most people currently at universities are non-religious, religion and religious claims are relatively foreign to, to people, right? And so you would, you, you would, it's, not, it's not like being uncomfortable with somebody else, it's that um, religious claims, religious ideas are something that is not natural to whatever this space is at, at universities, right? I think that's a plausible explanation. It certainly fits some of the experiences that I've had um, as an individual. Um, I think there's also a less benign explanation, right? And the less benign explanation is that there's affirmative ideological exclusion uh, behind that. And, um, and there's, there's, I certainly have personal, like personal anecdotes that, that fit that hypothesis. And, uh, but because of the reason I mentioned earlier, it's hard to support those kind of claims, right? So the faculty member hiring process at different universities is relatively opaque. There are lots of different decision makers at lots of different levels. They tend to be smart enough not to put bad things down on paper, right? And so it'd be hard to show that it was somebody's religious perspective, which is why I mentioned the Teresa Wagner case out at the University of Iowa College of Law, why it was such a uh, potentially powerful case because she had access, I'm not sure, I, I don't know why, 
Um, she had access to emails among different faculty members. It might be through public, uh, public records documents or something. And so those faculty members, you know, darn, shame on them, I guess, from their perspective, right? Don't put that stuff in writing. So I think there is, there is some, at least, uh, anecdotal evidence of, of intentional exclusion because, and so going back to your original question, I don't think it can be because of, uh, of hostility. Um, and in fact, speaking as a faculty member at a number of different institutions over time or going to different conferences, people will make claims that, that I, would, I have found um, as a religious person um, maybe not, not more than not sympathetic, right? So the claim would be um, off-putting, right? So not, 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 not directed at any particular person, but just the operative assumption was that religious people, religious ideas um, um, weren't going to be part of this conversation. So I don't think, so I don't think that it can be explained by fear of, fear of offense, although I think there is a little bit of evidence to support that. I think that those other explanations, which is benign foreignness or malign exclusion, or more plausible exclusions. And the one way to think about this would be, let's say that I was up here making the claim, universities are part of constrained debates, and we need to have all different perspectives of constrained debates, including, for example, gender perspectives, different racial experiences up there. And let's say that somebody out there said, well, you know, the explanation that I think is more plausible is that we're just worried about people of one race or one gender offending other people, right, because of where the background they bring. And I think your response would be that that's, that's implausible, that's incre you'd be incredulous about that explanation, right? And so for a similar reason, I'd be incredulous that it's a fear of off offensiveness that is causing people to exclude religious people from universities. Professor Cavalier. Uh, Mr. Schein, I'm very interested in your use of the word religious as opposed to orthodox or perhaps even fundamentalist. And the reason I ask that is I think there are many people in the university setting who would identify as religious, but who perhaps are not engaged in that religion in a way that you or some other folks of faith who practice in a more orthodox fashion would consider to be religious in the way you're using the term. Um, and I think if you look around the university, perhaps our law school, perhaps an array of other areas of this university, you might see a lot of people who are engaged in religious community but perhaps without the kind of dedication to orthodoxy that I think you're using religion to describe. So I'm a little bit curious about that. And then I think as a corollary, one other area that seems interesting to me about your points that you've made today um, are the role of people's choice to withdraw from university life as an intentional cultural, religio-cultural decision. Um, and what I'm most thinking of is the evangelical community here in the United States that views sending one's children to universities as a somewhat suspect move. Um, and I say this as a person who is married to an alum of Wheaton College in, in <coughs> Illinois, which people often refer to as the evangelical Harvard. Um, but within evangelical churches, even the choice to send children to Wheaton is viewed as suspect because the proper education should be obtained at a Bible college, at a truly religious organization representation of higher education, not at what you might think or I might think as a more liberal arts um, or a more diverse, kind of robust, broader university setting. Um, and if that's the case, that might partially explain why fewer people who are engaged in religious community, quad, orthodox religious community in this country are entering academia. Because quite frankly, when they're sending their children on to higher education, it's not the kind of credentialing that would prepare them to assume a professorship at a university. So I'm curious about both of these aspects of religion, orthodoxy, and then how this plays out in terms of religio-cultural values of religious communities. Thank you for both of those questions. Um, and so I didn't go into a long explanation about what counted as religion and what, and what I was talking about. And I meant my description about the, theoret the theoretical claims about what a university is to be um, ecumenical, broadly ecumenical, right? So, so universities are places of constrained debate. Uh, people of all different stripes of religion bring valuable, unique perspectives should be in there. Uh, people of all different religious perspectives around society should be in the university because they represent or and participate from that society. So my talk is me meant uh, primarily about, uh, the theoretical construct is meant to be ecumenical. Um, most of the examples were not ecumenical, I think for the reason that you gave. So I take Professor Cavalieri's description, at least of UT and her experiences where uh, was something to the effect of lots of religious people, but not traditionally orthodox practicing religious people, to be an acknowledgement, at least of the part of my point, right, which is that one major subset, maybe frankly the major 
facet of American religiosity is not widely represented at the University of Toledo. That instead, another manifestation of religion, which is a real uh, manifestation of religion in the United States, um, is represented disproportionately. So of the religious folks in the University of Toledo, by your description, most of them are of what statistically is a significant, a significant minority of, of broadly speaking um, American religious people. And I think that actually kind of fits the data as well. So there's been some studies, uh, there's a recent study by a guy named James Lingren from Northwestern about the demographic makeup of American law schools. And James Lingren described kind of the two categories of people who are most underrepresented compared to uh, people out in the working world. And, um, and the two groups of people um, were um, evangelical Christians, which was one facet of, of your point, and the other would be tra traditional Roman Catholics or Orthodox Roman Catholics. Um, and so both of those, that, that statistical data is consistent with your claim. So, um, okay, so, so I think what you're saying is, is accurate, um, and that for those folks who are, let's say, evangelical Christians, traditional Roman Catholics, traditional Muslims, traditional Jews, who are statistically underrepresented in the university, then my claim would still have robust, my, my claims would still have robust power. Um, and I also take, take, I want to acknowledge, and I think that there's power in your point, that some subset of at least some manifestations of religion in the United States are already created, or have already created their own subcultures for education, right? Um, the Bible college phenomenon that you identified as well. Um, so let me acknowledge that, and I think that could account for some of the lack of, let's say, evangelical Christians in law schools, universities more generally. Um, that wouldn't account for other religious traditions that are underrepresented. So I mentioned traditional Roman Catholics are the second most statistically significant group to not be included in law schools. Uh, a recent study about universities more generally regarding their religion said that the, said for universities, the largest the statistical disparity was Mormons, right? And, um, and in fact, the study went on to talk about what are, what, is the, what are public university faculty members' perceptions of different religious groups. And the group that came out on the bottom was Mormons, and kind of slightly above them was evangelical Christians. And so while acknowledging your point, I think that there are other explanations that could also, that I think do account for um, the relative dearth of at least some manifestations of religion in the United States. And let me say one other thing. So um, my talk was meant to be ecumenical about the theoretical construct and the implications. Uh, my own knowledge base is relatively limited, so I think that what I was saying applied to other religious perspectives, but, I'm, but that's one area that I'm not 100% sure about. So thank you for that question. Um, in the back. Hi, yes, so. Uh, yeah, I, um, I apologize for not being here for the first part, but it sounds like there's an assumption that this university doesn't have as many religious people as we should, or at least those people might be hiding their identities. I think that's, that's an implication of my claim, yeah. Okay, so I just wanted, and, and you may have numbers that I don't have on faculty, but the 20, did you use the climate survey data at all in? No, okay. uh, I, well, I, I can say why, but go on. Okay, so just know that the 2012 climate survey data indicates that only 20% of our student body fits in the category of the nuns. Um, and that, N O N E S, yeah, okay. the non affiliated, yeah. um, which leaves 80% having some form of commitment to a religious tradition, mm -hmm. which is actually, it, it means to me that we are more devout on average for that 18 to 24 year old demographic than the nation since current numbers are close to 40 percent in that age demographic for being non-affiliated. So to me it's interesting, I mean I just think University of Toledo is an interesting place for that reason that we tend to be actually, at least in our student body, more religious than average. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, you have anything else you want to say about that comment? Okay. Um, and so I had not, in, in thinking of these remarks, I had mostly in mind the, the role of faculty, faculty hiring and personnel. But I, my claim, I think, I, I want my claim to apply to students as well. Um, so the, the, the survey that you, that you identified um, suggests that 80% of UNT students self-identify as religious, right? And so my, and I, I haven't probed through those numbers what, what counts as that. My suspicion, consistent with my suspicion about Americans more generally claims, self-identification claims of religion, is that that's a relatively soft number, right? That when, it, when push comes to shove, what does that mean? That as, as a daily marker for, for their life, it actually doesn't mean a whole lot. So I think that actually the more relevant statistic would be, um, and the one that most surveys use, is how frequently does somebody attend religious services, right? And so 
I don't, I, and I don't know if that, I don't think that survey has that number. Um, and so that would, be, that would be a number that, if that number were relatively high, would make me more confident that, that, claim, that the claim of relatively robust religious identity in the student body um, is true. Um, although on that hand, uh, given the, the generational trends, it strikes me that that number would be low anyway, right? That as, as a general matter, young people in America tend to exercise religious identity uh, even less. But even assuming that the University of Toledo religious body is relatively robust to religious, which we were just talking about, um, that wouldn't impact my other claims, which is that the University of Toledo, um, uh, its curricular structure is not going to facilitate those students' uh, exploration of those religious questions because my, one, of my, sorry, one of my claims is that the modern university isn't able, is hindered from doing that as a place of constrained debate. Um, and then second, I've given some concrete examples of I think exclusion of religious students and religious student groups, which goes back to Professor Cavalieri's point, right? So it's not all religious student groups that are being excluded, it's only certain religious student groups that are being excluded. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, I guess my question is just, we do have a pretty robust religious studies program as well as a philosophy program. And I noted that you were worried that the university doesn't address ultimate questions, but that's what we do all day long for, you know, in our department. So, and we have, Roughly, uh, I want to get these numbers right. This could be undercounting at least 600 students who come through our doors every year. Um, and it might be more like 800 to take classes about the ultimate questions and learn about the answers from religious traditions. So how does that, how does that impact your claim? Sure. So I was thinking about that as I was preparing for this because I think one of the salutary, salutary phenomena in modern universities um, it starts at different places at different times. Um, some universities have had religious studies departments going back a long way, like UNC, I think, had theirs in the 20s, is my recollection. I think that's a salutary, that's a good phenomenon. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. At the same time, my claim is that uh, the medieval university was structured in order towards uh, the pursuit of big T truth. And, that, and I don't think the existence of, of religious studies departments undermines that claim, the claim that I'm making for the University of Toledo. So for example, I was looking up at the Religious Studies Department's website, and when I read the materials for the Religious Studies Department, it isn't that uh, the Religious Studies Department is, this is my perception as an outsider reading your publicly available materials, isn't pursuing, isn't helping a student from that student's religious perspective learn out, learn, is there a God um, based on my own religious traditions materials? Um, what is my relationship with that God? How should I live? How should I treat other people? Instead, I would characterize religious studies at UNC, UT, and elsewhere as being like law to some degree, as being like uh, chemistry, like how do the electrons move, right? It's an objective study about how these different people, religious people out there in this tradition or that tradition operate, and not, which I was claiming the medieval university had, which was from your religious perspective, how are you going to be the best X that you are? And so for example, uh, the Religious Studies Department's website says that students will study Christianity not confessionally advocating for the truth of Christianity, but historically as a coherent and influential world religion, which I think that's great. I love students learning more about Christianity, but I don't think that that's helping the student, but my perspective anyway, that's not a statement that we're going to help Christians understand what the relationship to their God is. Um, or another quote, we approach Islamic history, religion, jurisprudence, and culture from an academic perspective. And what do we do as academics? We objectively study the phenomenon that we're attempting to describe. And I think also the religious study department existence actually supports my claim really powerfully, right? So my claim is that at one time, theology was the discipline that organized all the different subject matters in a university. Religious studies departments don't do that, right? And you make no pre pretense of doing that, do you? Um, and you couldn't, right? You have a, a handful of faculty members compared to like other departments that are much, much bigger. So, 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 so uh, staffing wise, couldn't do it. Um, and getting back to Professor Cavalieri's point too. So thinking about the uh, perspectives of different faculty at religious studies departments, right? So um, religious, religious studies departments here and elsewhere um, um, arguably or ideally would have a broad perspective of the religious traditions um, of the different uh, uh, perspectives in the United States. And um, I don't know everybody in the religious studies department really well, but my perception is that uh, evangelical Christianity is not well represented or traditional Roman Catholicism, which would fit well with the statistical evidence, which shows that those groups are most significantly underrepresented in universities more generally. And so, and so even if there's a, a religious studies department, it's not um, participating in the constrained debate that I'm saying it should because it's not providing representative perspectives that are widely represented 
in our society. Dr. Oliver? Yes, um, the university has really a lot with probably most other major institutions have rather vague and onerous speech codes that prohibit offending. Much religious thought or speech will offend somebody out there. Might that be part of the problem? Um, so, so I, let, me, let me agree with your first claim, which is that the University of Toledo has an onerous speech code. And so, for example, when I teach, when I teach free speech law, we go through an, an anonymous speech code and we, and we dissect it. It turns out to be the University of Toledo's and the students are always stunned by how, uh, how uh, onerous it is. Um, so I think that that's true. Um, I guess I will push back a little bit. This is kind of Miss um, uh, uh, Boyer's claim, Dr. Professor Boyer's claim earlier that religious speech is uh, more likely to be offensive. I mean, I think in an environment when most people are not religious or view religion as being foreign, maybe that's possible, right? right. That, be, that if you were to say abortion is murder, that's going to offend a lot of people, but it may stem from a religious perspective, a yeah. religious world. Yeah. Uh, that will certainly offend a lot of people, a lot of people in this audience. Okay, in which, so I, I, I was, I was, I'm glad you used that comment, right? So. A person could say abortion, abortion is murder, and people might be offended by that claim, um, but that's not necessarily a religious claim. And so let's think of like claims, although it can be motivated by religious people, and in fact, I think that's part of the idea of a constrained debate is that religious people would bring, bring perspectives to a debate that would otherwise be underrepresented in an otherwise more secular uh, setting. Um, okay, so, so there is an owner of speech code that, uh, agreeing with you, there is an owner of speech code, it, um, relig religious people will bring perspectives that are unrepresentative and therefore for that reason be potentially offensive to people, right? Um, I'm not sure about the impact of the speech code on, on people's speech. In other words, um, if the claim that I'm describing, if, the cl if I'm describing, if I, what I'm saying is accurate, which is that statistically there are fewer religious people of varying types in public universities, including the University of Toledo, that I don't think can be accounted for by the speech code. In fact, I think that's actually evidence of the lack of religious diversity, if, if the claim is true that religious speech leads to be, people being offended, because it would be only an institution in which religious ideas, speech, and motivated claims are relatively foreign, would one think that a, that a speech code like that would not exclude religious ideas and religious people? Um, but I, I, don't know, I don't know if that can be a causable explanation for a lack of religious people. It could be a causal explanation for a lack of religious claims, right? So let's say that one were to do a debate on same-sex marriage, um, regardless of one's motivation, but let's say that one was going to do it because of a religious motivation, uh, which is part of the claim that I'm making, that those people are more likely to do, do debates from unrepresentative perspectives, then one might be fearful under the University of Toledo speech code because it's so capacious that doing that debate would get somebody in hot water. And even if you don't, even if the speech, the alleged speech code violation doesn't end in any long-term material repercussions on a faculty member or a student, that just having to go through the process, right, of having one's name potentially tarnished is a, is a, uh, is a, is, is a hindrance. So I think in that way, I would agree with what you're saying, that, it, that a robust speech code like what the University of Toledo has um, could hinder uh, what would otherwise be a more robust, more robust debate. Let me say one other thing, too. So we've had two comments about the potential um, offensiveness of religious or religiously motivated statements. And uh, I, I'm frankly surprised by that, right, because um, unless somebody says something with ill will, right, somebody directs something at a particular person, a, a claim like abortion is murder or a religiously motivated claim about whatever it might be, um, it's, it, it seems like the university should actually be preparing people for dealing with kind of claims made in good faith, right, that are still robust claims, abortion is murder, uh, uh, gun rights advocates and in killing people, right, there's lots of claims out there that can be religiously motivated. The university, universities like the University of Toledo, my claim would be, um, should in fact be encouraging people to develop the relatively thicker skin that is going to be needed in, in a broader society if the university is a training ground for what people are going to be like out in the real world because um, the debate in the university is relatively tame compared to the debate out in the, in the political world. So my short answer is to, to agree there is a robust speech code that um, it can constrain the debate by people who are already in that environment. Sir? It occurred to me that in uh, today's society, especially with millennials, the worst insult that you can hurl is that you're intolerant. And I'm just wondering if 
that intolerance element when you apply it to, you know, would someone have a greater or lesser desire to have constrained debate with someone they perceive to be intolerant? And with many religions and with moral absolutes within those religions, the conclusion is they're intolerant of other points of view. So do you think that that's part of what's stifling the debate? Yeah, so is, is, is what you're saying that a faculty member or a student who is not religious would say to a faculty member or a student who is religious and who is making a claim, either a religious claim or a non-religious claim for, for religious motivations, that the non-religious person would, the debate, they wouldn't even engage in the debate or the debate would see, quick, uh, quickly see? My experience, especially with millennials today, is that they want to have nothing to do with someone that's intolerant. Okay. And you're intolerant if you believe there's an absolute. Yeah. And so I think there's like the substantive question about whether or not the claim that a religious person might make, although of course a, a non-religious person could make. I'd say if you're evangelical and you say the only way to heaven is through Jesus. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so both religious and non-religious people can make relatively absolute claims, right? So I can imagine, well, I guess inherently, right, a non-religious person, a person who is a confirmed uh, atheists would have to say that there is no God. That seems like an absolute statement that would have the same intolerance characteristics of the hypothetical evangelicals claim on there. So I, I can imagine it going both ways, although practically I don't think it does. And that gets back to my point, which is that, or one of my points anyway, which I think is that there is a, there is a, a demographic imbalance in faculty and students in many universities um, because um, students are not familiar with that kind of an argument and therefore their first gut reaction is going to be I'm not going to engage with that person because that's an intolerant claim, as opposed to engaging that claim on the merits, which is one of the, one of the manifestations or implications of having universities as a, as a place of constrained debate, where a person will become familiar with that claim, overcome one's emotional obstacles to that claim, and therefore be able to engage in the merits with that claim um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive, respectful, yet still robust way. One more, Dean Barrows. Professor Richmond, that's right. Uh, uh, Professor Harris. <laughs> <laughs> With age comes wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> what I see as a very, as a very heart of the controversy that you're speaking about is to what degree should the public university tolerate Intolerance. In other words, if we have a candidate for uh, the faculty who is uh, religiously obliged to not tolerate uh, unorthodox sexual practices, we know that that person is going to make decisions about others. Thank you very much, Professor Richmond, for that question. Um, so let me say a couple of things about that. So the, the paradigm that I've set up of universities as constrained debates, including re representative perspectives of the broader society, um, wants that debate to be constrained and still be an ongoing debate. And so I think that if there was a critical mass of faculty members or students who took the position that you're, you're describing, which is, I'm going to shut down the debate on whatever the subject matter is. It could be in class or it could be in faculty hiring. And I think that would be something that my model doesn't allow for. Right? So in other words, I want to, I guess, buy in to, to some degree to what you're saying. Now let me push back a little bit, which is that I don't think that that's, I'm not aware of a public university where that phenomenon is, is or is about to occur on the student or faculty level, right? So is there a law school that I know best, and I cannot think of a law school, I cannot think of a law school where the perspective that you identified, which is that somebody's intolerance would, would, would uh, preclude, would create a critical mass of preclusion for faculty hiring, curricular discussions, in-class discussions. I can't, I, I'm not aware of that place occurring, uh, existing. You don't think that person who many would describe as homophobic would be would be as likely to get an appointment as a person who was not. Well, I, maybe, I, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. I was understanding you to say 
that univert that what do you do with people who are intolerant? In other words, who will who will full stop whatever the subject or discussion is. So I'm not going to hire a person with unorthodox sexual practices, right? That was your hypothetical. Um, and I, what I was saying was that if that if that group of people reaches a critical mass, in other words, they have the ability to block hiring, let's say, um, then that would be inconsistent with the model that I'm out, outlying. But I don't think that that law school or university exists in a, in a public sphere that I'm aware of. And so, so theoretically, I think that that's, that's a, you're identifying a limit that my model describes, um, um, but it's, it's a theoretical limit. Should I do another one? All right. Mrs. Kirk? Ross, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in light of, of that comment, I kind of feel like this idea of a re university being a home for people of goodwill, including religious people, is an exercise in futility. Because if you look at today's society, you have people of religious intent who have a completely different worldview from those without religious intent. And so they come at things this way. Okay. You'll have somebody say, well, I don't really, I feel that like unorthodox sexual practices are immoral behaviors. That doesn't mean I hate you, I'm intolerant, I will persecute you, but my worldview says that that's wrong. Somebody else might say, well, gosh, what a homophobic jerk. And you can't go anywhere because neither side will acknowledge that a Christian or somebody else may say this out of love and mercy, but love as the foremost thing, but a non-religious will simply look at that as intolerance. So how can you even be on the same playing field? Well, I, get, I think I kind of understand what you're saying, but I'm not 100% sure. So I took Professor Richman's comment to be not just the hypothetical person who says, I think what potential candidate X is doing is wrong, but I'm not going to hire that person for that reason, right? And what you're saying is something slightly different, I think, and I think less of a challenge, at least to my position, if it was meant to be a challenge to my position, which is that um, people, people do not have to understand the claims that other people are making so long as those claims are consistent with an on, ongoing good faith discussion on those subjects. And so I guess, are you saying that just by saying something that um, is perceived as intolerant by other people is going to be a conversation stopper? Well, I guess that was the question. If, if somebody is viewed as intolerant because of a religious view, then why would that person be hired given the constraints? The constraints that I identify? Um, so I guess I was, re I was accepting only a small part of what Professor Richmond was saying, which is that if you get to a critical mass of people who will effectively put, a, put an end to the constrained debate through hiring or curriculum or teaching or whatever it might be, that would be a limit. But if you have one, two, whatever the non-critical mass number is of people, who make, let's say, robust claims like what you're making, but that would, that would I guess, simply be a, a manifestation of th their participation in that debate over whatever that particular issue might be there. And other people might think of that as being an intolerant claim, which we've talked a lot about, um, but, that, but that would be representative of the type of claims in the broader society, and it would also be consistent with the university's inability to be able to make substantive, substantive judgments about the veracity or lack of veracity of that hypothetical person's claim. So my structure wouldn't allow for the university to have any basis upon which to say that person can't come in unless they put a stop to the debate. And that person would be representative, I assume, of perspectives out in society more generally. Thank you very much.